says, asking, seeking, and knocking. Um, more misconceptions, I believe, about these verses, about what it means and about how we maybe treat them, uh, how Christians may treat them, even non-Christians may treat them. Um, and I want to help, hopefully help you in showing you that there's, a, there's some other ways to look at this uh, that may not be uh, over, over, <laughs> overly accepted, as it were. But if we look at the text and stick to the text, uh, I can prove to you and show you that there's another way to look at this text, which I think and believe will be incredibly uh, helpful. So we're looking at this principle of prayer. We can only ask, we can only seek, uh, we can only knock when it's about prayer. Prayer that serves to show that God has made himself accessible, made himself accessible at multiple levels, also reminding us that only through the cross is any of this access possible. Only through the cross is God made accessible. Now just as I say that, I need to say this. It doesn't mean that there's multiple ways to God. It doesn't mean that multiple access or multiple making God multiple accessible means there is multiple ways to get to him. It's important to state it's only possible through Jesus Christ, through the cross, through faith in Jesus Christ alone. But what we'll learn as we look into this is that God has made it possible for every single person of whatever intellect or ability to be able to access his wonderful provision. So you're already getting a sense, our seek knock is a way that God makes grace and mercy available to anybody of whatever place and whatever ability they are at. So this free level invitation means that from our own perspective, if we know God is close enough to ask, or if we sometimes feel he's far away or, or difficult to get close to, be it barriers or distance, we can seek and we can knock and we can find him. And fundamentally, he will always hear. No matter what place you are, in terms of your reference to God at that point, in terms of your emotions towards him, whatever it may be, God will hear. God hears all the time. We'll learn that what sits at the foundation of this permitted approach to God is that God himself, through Jesus Christ, has made this possible. And only because God the Son died on the cross for the sins of evil mankind. So in understanding these two points, we'll then understand why it's important that whatever the outcome, we should be most pleased and relieved that God determines and knows what is right and good for us. So let's look at what it says. What do the verses say? Uh, and then we'll, we'll go through what that means and the application. Uh, seven to eight says... Uh, ask and it will be given. Matthew 7, 7 to 8. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks and receive, asks and receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Prayer is really what this is. We, we don't just walk around asking God for things. God, can I have that? God, can I have this? We do it in prayer. We, we have to find a place, approach him, and find our private place with him and go into prayer. But prayer simply is making our request known to God. This is what we're doing. We're making our request known to him. And he says, everyone who asks receives. Receiving is the reward of asking. But it's more than just asking. It is, it is confession. It is adoration. It's thanksgiving, it's fellowship, it's being with God. I mean, the Holy Spirit dwelling within all believers is when we come to pray, we're fellowshipping with God. Maybe something we take for granted. Prayer is talking with God, plain and simple. It is in seeking that we search after God, his word and his will, and he, and he who seeks 
finds. Finding is the reward of seeking. I know this seems really simple, but we have to reinforce this, don't we? It is to knock and wait until the door is opened. Not in vain, but instead in this expectation that God will deliver on his promises. That in line with the will of God, Jesus says it will be opened, it will be done. What proof do we have then that God will do that? The cross. What did Jesus say? He said, it is done. He did everything that was said at the beginning. So we seek entrance into the great heavenly palace of our great king. Entering through the open door into his palace is this reward of knocking. And it's the best reward of all. But maybe more importantly, God here promises an answer to the person, the one who diligently seeks it. When we ask, when we seek God for anything, in Jesus' name, he hears us. If we truly search for God, God says, you'll find me. And we'll be reminded that God is always there. So then he goes on. Which of you, 9 to 11, if your son asks for bread and give him a stone, we'll give him a stone. Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Jesus makes it clear that God doesn't have to be persuaded or appeased in prayer. He's not a little God. As many we saw and we see in the Old Testament, many things, they had to appease these little gods with things. They had to do things for them to make them so they didn't come after them, as it were, or, or punish them or kill them. But God is not that God. He's not the God that needs to be persuaded or appeased. He wants to give us not just bread, but even more than that, we, what we ask for. The assurance of an answer to prayer is based on the fact that God is our Father. And he treats his children with good, or as a good and wise earthly parent would. He says no kind parent would mock his child by answering his cry for bread with stones. But even as a kind and good uh, parent, humans, us can be, does not mean we're not evil. In this case, when we look at the verses, it's referring to our sinful nature. Human love is not even comparable to the great love God has for mankind. Man's love is conditional. Whether you, you know it to be true, whether you, you know that you do that, or subconsciously that you don't necessarily know you do that, it is conditional. We put conditions on our love. Probably the... the, the Best example is when we, when we are easily offended by family. And the one thing we do is withdraw. The one thing we do is we step back. That's conditional love. The condition is you be good to me, otherwise I won't be good to you. God says, you have nothing good to offer me, but I'm going to be all good to you. God's love is unconditional, expecting nothing in return. So Jesus makes that comparison. If we can be good in our evil, how good will God be who is truly good? And then the final verse we'll be looking at. So in everything, do to others what you should have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. This is referred to as the golden rule. It is the thing that base, is based in everything that Jesus talks about. And there's many versions of this rule, but there's one difference to how Jesus phrased it. In culture, the saying is mostly used in a negative way. I don't know if you've ever noticed this. It's used in a very negative way. 
you should not do to your neighbour what you would not want him to do to you. Jesus switches that in the positive. Do to others what you would have them do to you. And Jesus says that sums up the law and the prophets. If we would simply treat others the way we would want to be treated, we would naturally obey all the law, all the law says about our relationship with others. So, our meaning and application. <coughs> Excuse me. Ask, seek, knock. There's an understanding about this uh, which suggests a rising intensity of the way we should pray, the way we should ask God. We should first ask as a single action, Lord, will you help me with this or do this, please? And then up the level a bit more by then going, I'm going to seek you and be more persistent. And then knock, go a bit further. Even further persistence. But I don't, I don't believe this to be the case at all, actually. I struggle with this concept because of what it says about us when we use this method of rising intensity. Let me, let me just play this out. If this all means levels of persistence, what does it say about us and the God we believe in? About us, it says that rather than persistence, we, we should keep bothering God until he answers us. God, 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 I want this, I want this, God. And if he won't hear me, I'm going, look, I'm going to go looking for him. He's not hearing me. I'm going, to, I'm going to go and look for him. I'm going to seek him. And then I'm going to tell him. And you know what I'm going to do when I'm going to find him? I'm going to knock on that door until he opens it. God, God, I'm here now. I'm at the door. God, open the door. Do you see how this persistent concept is kind of a little bit pointless? In my view, it's certainly not biblical. It just means we badger him. I'm not sure that's the God we serve. Like as if he's hard of hearing or just doesn't want to speak to us or doesn't want to hear from us. What does it say about God? It says he's partially deaf. It says he might be ignorant. says he runs away and hides doesn't want to hear from us depends on the day god's having doesn't it then he locks himself away locks himself away from us until we go away or give up i mean these these are extremes in what i'm talking about but when you talk about persistence and it applies to only a persistence principle it says more about the god which is not a biblical god he doesn't need persuading. He just wants to hear from us. This method of persistence amounts to us needing to corner God. Got you now. Here's all my command. Here's all my, my, my requests and my demands. I want this, I want that. But wasn't we warned about this? Wasn't we warned about this way of viewing God? Matthew 6, verse 7, and when you pray, we learned this some weeks ago, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. That's persistence, isn't it? It's not, we're, we're good to be persistent, but that's not the right persistence. That's what Jesus is saying. Just to keep going and going and going just so you could be heard and look good. So I want to, maybe if you don't know, maybe if you maybe don't see it the way I'm, I'm explaining it, I want us to instead see this as a, some form of 
uh, instead of seeing it as some form of army drill. We, we, don't, we don't need to perform for God. Does this make sense? My, the way I perform in my prayer does not impress God. How I lament does not impress. It doesn't impress him. He says, you're like oily rags. You're like dirty rags, he says. There's nothing you can offer. I can do it to Jesus. I can say, Lord, you're my saviour. I don't need to, to bang on all the time. I say, Lord, here's my prayer. And if you do it, it is in your will. If you don't do it, it's not in your will. And how are you going to accept it? So it's not about trying to be more and more persistent until God gives in or seeing it as needing to repeat ourselves over and over again to a, some sort of partially hard-hearing God. Let me give you three verses that explain this idea. Philippians 4 verse 6, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, for a prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. There is a way to, to bring and repeat to God, but it's not in petition alone and it's not in repetition alone. Always with thanksgiving, always with worshipping. Thank you, Lord. Mark 11, verse 24. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Does that sound like someone who needs to go on for 20 minutes? Asking the same thing until they think that God's answering. Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you've received it. It will be yours. And in John 15, verse 7, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. In no translation, in no way in these verses does it say that God will only do this on one condition. that you lament and perform and look really good and impressive in front of everyone else, even in front of God. Just pray. Doesn't matter if you pray quietly, doesn't matter if you pray loudly, pray as if you're thanks, thanking God. I've said it before and I'll say it again, prayer at its most fundamental level is meant to bring you peace of mind and peace in your heart. That God is able to know the right thing for you. That God is able to do the right thing for you and give the right thing to you. So instead we see, ask, seek, knock as three levels of access. Three levels of access to God that is designed to not exclude a single believer from God's mercy, God's grace, and God's provision. Instead, to enjoy this great provision. Here we are invited to pray to God. To know that he is present and able to respond in whatever place we find ourselves in. God not only wants us to pray, but to enjoy praying. It is not meant to be a hardship to pray. You're meant to enjoy a relationship with him. So that's why it's not about performing, you see. It's not about whether God says, oh, you prayed really well. The words you used were so elegant and you're such a great speaker. He's not looking for this great orator in prayer. He's looking for an honest heart. Someone that will just go, this is my prayer. Lord, I don't know how else to say it other than please help me. It's not a chore. It's not a drill. It is to be able to speak to the one true perfect God of the universe. I think what stops us from accepting that prayer uh, is enjoyable and a privilege and to enjoy even asking God for things is that we think we have to badger the spirit. I've seen so many church services where 
It's great to see people in the spirit. It's great to see people praying in the spirit. There is a point, however, when orderly worship is no longer being obeyed. When reverence is gone and it's all about enjoyment for me. That's not worshipping God. How much we enjoy it in that sense, it's not relevant. Gift of prayer is a gift. It's an amazing opportunity. It's almost as if we should almost pray as if the emotional and physical effort is equal to praying in the spirit itself. As I said, it's not our performance that God wants or grants things to us. He's not impressed by how holy we look. We must accept that whatever we are, where we are emotionally, spiritually or mentally, God is where he always has been and always will be. Close to us through the Holy Spirit. The three levels of ask, seek, knock merely account for where we might be rather than where God is. If a child is present, he asks him for what he needs. If a child is somewhere in the house but cannot see his father, he seeks his father for what he needs. If a child is seemingly in front of a door, he knocks to get what he needs. The only potential rising of intensity is the distance and barrier we place between us and God. So the comfort is in knowing that in whatever place we find ourselves, he is always in the same place near us and able to respond. Acts 17, 26 to 28. From one man, he made all the nations they, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though he's not far from any one of us. Sounds like a counterintuitive statement, doesn't it? it it doesn't make sense, hang on, but you just said I have to find him, and yet you say he's near us, because that is how it works. It is not God that moves away, it is us that moves away. It is us that steps back. It is us that tries almost to uh, almost allow the attack on us to create this gap, but God is never far away. So the context of finding him is that you can literally find him in front of you. We just tend to not look in front of us. It goes on, for in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Psalm 145 verse 18, the Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. So Jesus says, do these things, and believe that in doing them, you will get an answer. You'll find the truth and a door will be open to you. What Jesus does in verses 9 to 11 is to reinforce that statement by comparing the worldly goodness of man with the heavenly goodness of God. Verses 9 to 11, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Here, Jesus is helping us to understand the problem with the statement, I am a good person. Can evil people do good things? Yes. Evil people can do good things. But what is wrapped up in this statement is quite a big piece of theology. Our so-called goodness is wrapped up in something bigger we may not see. Our acts of goodness from a human, sinful perspective, in some way or another, will look to do our good deeds out of gain for ourselves. Because that's what sin is. Sin is about ourself. It's selfishness. In this example in particular, Jesus explains that in our evilness, we still give good gifts to our children. In other words, if there was anything redeemable about us, 
if and which there isn't. If there was anything redeemable, it might be that we give good gifts. But the problem is, is where it comes from and the intention of which it is given. It is still bound up in sinfulness. It's still bound up in evil. The reason for reminding us that we are sinful and evil is to highlight the comparison with God in the different places spiritually that human and God comes from. Sinful people give good things from a sinful place. This makes the evil no less evil. But in essence, a good deed done by a sinful person. God, however, gives good things from a perfect place. This makes the good perfect. So when you understand this, this sense of separation between us, you get the difference between why he says, how much more then will your father give you gifts? If I am sinful and evil, I can barely give something good to my children sufficiently enough to maybe please them. But it still comes from an evil place. God, however, says, I already come from the best place, the perfect place. So how good is what I give perfect? So this makes good the most good good can be. Good, good and good. In that case, Jesus says, how much more will that good be, especially given to those who are sinful and in need of Jesus for their salvation, which is the ultimate good that God has offered to all people who believe in Jesus Christ. And so we come to the cross and the good that has come from it. Yes, to enjoy that good, of course, of what Jesus has done, but to glorify God for that good. So understanding we are sinful and unable to be truly good, we have a saviour who bled on the cross for sinful people. In that act, and therefore the offer of that salvation, evil, sinful people are offered the choice, let's understand this, I'm going to say it slowly, evil, sinful people are offered the choice to be adopted by an all-holy God. Sinful, horrible, evil people, God says, you're welcome. Your stain, your whatever you've done, it can be forgiven through Jesus. Matthew 20, verse 28, says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus gave his life to offer the chance for anyone to come to him and be saved. It is absolutely a guarantee. I'm telling you, you don't need to worry whether you're going to lose your salvation. You know why? Because the only way you're going to lose it is if you reject God. I'm telling you that once you accept Jesus, the guarantee is the most 100%, I'm going to say iron, but even iron's not strong. Titanium, diamond, diamond. Even so, still not. Still not. 100%, the strongest possible element you could ever think of, that's the promise cannot be broken in that acceptance of salvation we are made children of God who are now able to receive the good things Jesus speaks about Matthew 26 verse 28 this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins because of Christ's blood our sins are forgiven they're forgiven when we trust in him this is why even though Jesus calls us evil, we can be the children of God and count on him to give good things to us when we ask him. So we come to the position of our heart, the position of our mind, 
and that's position of our spirit in regards to ask, seek, and knock. As believers in Christ who know that the ultimate good gift is salvation through Jesus, we accept that we do not get everything we ask for. Here are two reasons I'm going to tell you why, and this is really important part of these verses, why it's important to know why you don't get everything you ask for. And this, this is for me, when I read this, when I was reading this, this is, the, uh, this is the best way I've ever seen this explained. It kind of, it switches it on you, it reverses it, and you think, well, I don't want everything. I really do not want everything I ask for. Let me explain. First, if we get everything we ask for, we would in effect be God. If you could just say something and say, I want that, and it's done, makes you God. Only God can do that. If we were granted everything and anything by God, then in effect, we're God. And that might sound like an entertaining notion. Strangely, in false teaching, it is, it is said a lot. There's little God theology which suggests that you should almost accept you are a God. Terrible teaching. Unbiblical. Heretical. So it might sound good to say, what? Oh my God. What people don't see is the burden of it. The burden of perfect godly wisdom that comes with it. So that means if you get everything, it means you have to be perfectly good with it. You would need to know how every decision would turn out to be able to be given everything and anything we ask for. That's impossible. You can't know that. You can't know that the thing you're asking for is the right thing. You can't even know that what you're asking for you're going to get. There's a good reason why you can't know that. It won't work for our good. It won't work for us. Just look at the world around us now. You can see that even the things that people can choose to have through God's amazing grace, even now that God allows people to have, is abused. What more damage can we do if we've given everything and anything we ask God for? Imagine the damage we could do. Secondly, verse 9 and 10 of our reading actually prompts us to also invert the question. What if a child asks for a stone or a serpent? Will he give that to them? No. The answer is no, he won't. Because it implies that a good father will not give his child a stone or a serpent. It clearly says that. It won't, he won't do that. Why? Because a stone is no good and a serpent may kill you. I mean, this is basic parenting, isn't it, guys? Uh, have I been doing it wrong? Maybe, maybe I should have given my child when he was growing up a serpent. Oh, is that what you want? Oh, you can have it. It's fine. You can have anything you like. It's all going to be good for you, I promise. This is why you do not, we do not want everything we ask for. Because we're not good at asking for the right thing all the time. We're not good at it. <laughs> Whatever we think is good for us, God knows better. So I want, I want to tell you that because we, we often just go straight to the statement, God knows better, don't worry church, don't worry Christians, God knows better. I want to explain why God knows better. It's because we ask for stupid things. We ask for things that are not healthy for us. We ask for things that won't help us. So God says, that won't help you, even though it may feel like it will help you. It probably won't. As she says, it won't. He knows it won't, and he knows it will. 
In fact, in God's judgment, to know what we need and not need, to give and to not to give, he is in fact bestowing on us a great mercy. When you see it that way, oh, merciful God, thank you for not giving me everything. Because we realize months later, when we think about the thing we asked for before, we think, hold on a second, if, I, if he'd given me that, I'd be here right now, I'd be in this different place right now. I'd be in debt right now. I'd be homeless right now. But it's a great mercy that's not only to us, but also to the world, that we do not get everything we ask for. So instead, we are to be people who are continually seeking the will of God, so that when we ask, seek, and knock, we are constantly aligning ourselves with the expectation that whatever the outcome, whatever the response, God knows best. Philippians 4, 10 to 13. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at, last, that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Uh, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Paul says it doesn't matter. Whatever it is, whatever place I'm in, God knows best for me. He's the only source of strength that, uh, that I need. And so with that knowledge, belief and acceptance of Jesus Christ and his sufficiency in his provision... To know what is for our good in any given circumstances, he summarized this in verse 12. So in everything do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. Because of God's great mercy, God's great grace, God's great provision for us, just as God does good for our good, and gives us good things, so give good to others. And it sounds like we're getting into the realm of saying, give stuff to people, give money to people. This is, this is bigger. This is bigger. With the last statement here, it achieves in the mind of the believer is that it's not in the negative that you merely not do bad things to people. So be neutral effectively, rather that we do something in the positive in helping others. Ultimately, that doing of something positive can be, of course, in the day-to-day. -day. We don't underestimate the power of helping someone practically. But let me tell you from my point of view, when I was a, a non-believer, I had someone tell me about Jesus. Now, I can stand here today and say the, the greatest thing someone could do for me was to tell me about Jesus. And at the very least, they offered me the choice of what I'm able to choose. But also know the consequence of it. They were not shy in telling me that if you don't choose Jesus, you're heading to hell. And so I do that here today and I do it in my life. And I say to you, I would, would always wanted them to tell me, even though at the time I didn't know they needed to tell me. And so now I say, well, I want to tell them that as well, tell other people that and serve them. I say, look, guys, this is the truth. This is it. There's no messing around with this anymore. There's going to spend eternity with God, choosing Jesus, believing that he's the saviour, or there's not choosing him, and there's going to hell for eternity. There's tons of theories around, well, hold on a minute. At some point, won't God pluck us from hell and then bring us back? No, he won't. He won't do that because we chose it. God, in the Bible, if you look at and read it, he gives us over to the choices we make. Every single time, without fail, he hands us over. 
He says, if that's what you want, that's what you have. That's what you get. So now as a Christian, being well aware of what I've been saved from and the grace that has been lavished upon me, which is I still don't understand why. As I go through my day to day and think, how does God say this mess? Through Jesus. Nothing I can do can change that. Nothing I can do can make him more impressed. He is only impressed with himself. Sounds really selfish, but God is impressed with himself. Because he is God. I would want someone else to know that. I would want to do for others as others have done for me. So let me leave you with this kind of little riddle here. We want others to know what we now know. That which we should have wanted to know, but didn't know. But they told us anyway. And now we know. But all the more grateful for God are we for that. At some point, someone spoke something into your life that planted the seed, that made something happen, that made you see that God is true, that Jesus died and rose again for all our sin, to redeem us from death. And so we should be all the more grateful for that. So as we're Christians now, as we're people that know God, and, and so we want others to know this amazing God. He is a good, good father. A good, good father. He gives you things you don't deserve. He gives you things you didn't expect. And all the while, all those things now will ultimately count for naught because ultimately what will happen is we'll leave these bodies and we'll join them in new bodies in heaven. But along the way, God is going to give us some, some things, some good, good things so that we can continue on the journey of sanctification, of being more like Jesus. I'm going to pray.